I raise for you, vous levez. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is now in session. La Diancia Tribunal Penal International for Lex Yugoslavia at Tuvert. Please be seated. Registrar, please, uh, would you call the case? Good afternoon, Mr. President, Your Honors. This is case number IT9936A, the prosecutor versus Radoslav Berjanin. Thank you. Could I please have the appearances of the parties, uh, the prosecution first? Good afternoon, Your Honors. Helen Brady appearing on behalf of the prosecution. With me today are Ms. Katerina Margetz and Ms. Barbara Goy and our case manager, Ms. Louis Galicia. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brady. The defense. Good afternoon, Your Honors. I'm John Ackerman, and I'm here with Ms. Barbara Barouche. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Berdanin, can you hear uh, the proceedings in a language you can understand? Dobar dan svima. Mogu da pratim jeziku koji razumi. Thank you, Mr. Berdani. You may sit down. <coughs> As the registrar announced, the case on our agenda today is Prosecutor versus Radoslav Berdani. <coughs> In accordance with the scheduling order issued on 16 March 2007, the Appeals Chamber will now deliver its judgment. Following our usual practice, I will not read out the text of the judgment except for the disposition. Instead, I will summarize the issues raised on appeal and the findings by the appeals chamber. I emphasize that this is a summary only and that the authoritative account of the chamber's findings is to be found in the written judgment which will be made available at the end of this session. The operative indictment in this case charged Berdanin with a range of crimes committed between April and December of 1992 in Bosnia-Herzegovina and particularly in the autonomous region of Kraina, also known as ARK. During this time, Berdanin held various positions in the ARK including serving as the president of the ARK crisis staff and later of its successor body, the ARK war presidency. In a judgment of 1 September 2004, Trial Chamber 2 convicted Berdanin pursuant to Article 7, 1 of the Statute of the Tribunal 4. Persecution as a crime against humanity, count three, incorporating torture as a crime against humanity, count six, deportation as a crime against humanity, count eight, and inhumane acts, forcible transfer, as a crime against humanity, count nine, willful killing as a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, count five, torture as a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, count seven, wanton destruction of cities, towns, or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity as a violation of the laws or customs of war, count 11. And destruction or willful damage done to institutions dedicated to religion as a violation of the laws or customs of war, count 12. The trial chamber found Berdanin not guilty of the crimes of 
genocide, count one, complicity in genocide, count two, extermination as a crime against humanity, count four, and unlawful and wanton extensive destruction and appropriation of property not justified by military necessity as a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, count 10. Trial chamber two sentenced Berdani to a single sentence of 32 years imprisonment. Both the prosecution and Berdani appealed the judgment and we heard oral arguments regarding these appeals on 7 and 8 December 2006. In these oral arguments and in an earlier written brief, we also heard the views of the Association of Defense Council with regard to the issue of Joint Criminal Enterprise, JCE, which features prominently in the prosecution appeal. I will first briefly address the grounds of appeal put forward by Berdanin and then turn to those put forward by the prosecution. In his appeal, Berdanin raised well over 150 alleged errors. I shall not discuss all of them. Instead, I shall first discuss the appeal chamber's general approach to addressing these alleged errors. I will then discuss the appeal chamber's overall conclusions with regard to Berdanin's challenges to the trial chamber's findings as to Bosnian Serb political agenda and his own role in its implementation. Lastly, I will discuss certain alleged errors that constitute direct challenges against specific convictions. To begin with, the Appeals Chamber has chosen to dismiss summarily a high number of the errors alleged by Berdanin. The Appeals Chamber has done so where the alleged errors. One, challenge factual findings on which a conviction does not rely. Two, misrepresent the trial chamber's factual findings or ignore other relevant factual findings. Three, constitute mere assertions that the trial chamber failed to consider relevant evidence. Four, constitute mere assertions that the trial chamber could not have reasonably inferred a particular conclusion from circumstantial evidence. Five, are clearly irrelevant or lend support to the challenged finding. Six, challenge the trial chamber's reliance or lack of reliance on one piece of evidence without explaining why the finding should not stand on the basis of the remaining evidence. Seven, are contrary to common sense. Or eight, relate to factual findings whose relevance is unclear. In practice, through these eight categories I mentioned, the Appeals Chamber has disposed of dozens of Berdanin's alleged errors in a summary way. Nonetheless, the Appeals Chamber has dealt in a substantial fashion with the many other alleged errors. Some of these alleged errors go to the Trial Chamber's findings with regard to the Bosnian Serb political agenda and Berdanin's role in its implementation. The Appeals Chamber has not found Berdanin's argument in this respect convincing, so as to warrant a reversal of his conviction. In particular, the Appeals Chamber leaves undisturbed the Trial Chamber's conclusions about the following. The nature of the strategic plan to create a Serbian entity from which most non-Serbs would be permanently removed. The authority of the ARK crisis staff over municipal authorities, including the Prehidor municipality. The relationship between the ARK and other bodies, 
such as the Bosnian Serb army, the police, and the paramilitary groups. And the contribution of the ARK crisis staff decisions to the dismissals, disarmament, and resettlement of the non-Serb population. The appeal chamber also leaves undisturbed the trial chamber's findings that Berdaning had knowledge of and made contribution to the strategic plan, and that Berdaning knew that crimes were being committed in furtherance of the strategic plan. I now turn to Berdanin's challenges as they relate to specific crimes. I will begin by discussing matters on which the appeals chamber reverses the trial chamber. There are two such matters. The first matter relates to Berdanin's conviction for torture in the camps and detention facilities. Berdanin claims that the trial chamber erred in finding that he aided and abetted these tortures. The appeal chamber agrees that there is insufficient evidence for a reasonable trial of fact to find that Berdanin's conduct had a substantial effect on the commission of torture. The trial chamber inferred that Berdanin's failure to intervene to prevent torture in the camps and detention facilities together with his public attitude, had the effect of encouraging personnel in camps and detention facilities to commit torture. The trial chamber reached this conclusion, however, without any evidence that such personnel were even aware of Berdanin's public attitude towards the camps and facilities. The appeals chamber accordingly reverses Berdanin's convictions for torture in camps and detention facilities. In particular, the appeals chamber overturns Berdanin's conviction for aiding and abetting members of the Bosnian Serb forces in the commission of the following crimes. The torture of a number of Bosnian Muslim civilians in the Kozila camp in early July 1992. The torture of a number of Bosnian Muslim women in the Karatarm camp in July 1992. The torture of a number of Bos Bosnian Muslim women in the Ternopolia camp between May and October 1992. The torture of a number of Bosnian Muslim women in the Omarska camp in June 1992. The torture of a number of Bosnian Muslim men in the SUP building in Teslic, and the torture of a number of Bosnian Muslim and Bosnian Croat civilians in the community building in Pribinic in June 1992. For the reasons mentioned in the judgment, the appeals chamber does not address whether Berdanin could instead be liable for these acts of torture via a theory of omission proper. <clears throat> the reversal of this conviction also has a limited effect on part of Berdanin's conviction for persecution. The appeals chamber also proprio motu reverses the trial chamber in another respect. It reverses the conviction entered by the trial chamber for wanton destruction of cities, towns, or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity <clears throat> to the extent that this conviction relates to the municipality of Bosanska Krupa. For the other municipalities, however, the appeal chamber concludes that the trial chamber did not err in finding Berdanin responsible beyond reasonable doubt for aiding and abetting the crimes of one, wanton destruction of cities, towns, and villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity, and two, destruction or willful damage 
done to religious institutions. I now turn to other challenges raised by Berdanin to his convictions for specific crimes. Berdanin raises numerous other challenges in the relation to his conviction for torture. He claims that the trial chamber erred as a matter of law in finding that severe pain or suffering is the level required for a finding of torture. The appeal chamber rejects this argument and affirms that severe pain or suffering <coughs> is the appropriate level required under customary international law for a finding of torture. Whether this level is met is a fact-specific inquiry to be carried out by a trier of facts. In particular, the appeals chamber rejects Berdanin's suggestion that a recent and subsequently withdrawn memorandum of the United States Department of Justice has modified such standard under international law. Not only has the memorandum been withdrawn, but in any event, the position of only one state could not change customary international law. Berdanin also claims that certain acts of torture, namely rapes and sexual assaults, were individual domestic crimes rather than crimes committed in the context of an armed conflict or as part of a widespread and systematic attack. The appeals chamber rejects this argument, as the fac facts of this case clearly support the trial chamber's findings otherwise. The trial chamber did not reach an unreasonable conclusion when it determined that crimes committed by combatants and by members of forces accompanying them while searching for weapons during an armed conflict and taking advantage of their position are crimes committed in the context of an armed conflict. The trial chamber also reasonably concluded from the evidence that these crimes occurred as a part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. Berdanin raises certain other challenges with regard to his conviction for aiding and abetting acts of torture committed during attacks on towns, villages, and neighborhoods. The appeals chamber rejects these challenges. In particular, it leaves undisturbed the trial chamber's conclusion that ARK crisis staff decisions, including those on disarmament, had a substantial effect on these attacks. With regard to his conviction for willful killing, Berdanin argues that this conviction must be overturned because, among other things, the trial chamber failed to show that the forces that committed these killings were third forces from Bosnia, as opposed to, for example, groups from Serbia. In light of the clear definition given to the expression Bosnian Serb forces in the indictment, a trial and in the trial judgment, the appeals chamber rejects this argument. Berdanin also raises certain challenges to his conviction for persecution. The trial chamber had found that Berdanin aided and abetted the crime of persecution with respect to the following acts. Willful killing, torture, destruction of property and religious buildings, deportation and forcible transfer, physical violence, rapes, sexual assault, constant humiliation and degradation, denial of the right to freedom of movement, and denial of the right to proper judicial process. The trial chamber had also found that Berdanin instigated the crime of persecution with regard to deportation and forcible transfer and ordered the crime of persecution with respect to the denial of the right of employment. 
The appeals chamber dis dismisses Berdanin's argument that, as a matter of law, certain types of conduct, that is, acts of physical violence, the denial of the right not to be denied, denied employment, and the denial of the rights of freedom of movement and proper judicial process fall outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. In this regard, the appeals chamber recalls that acts underlying persecutions under Article 5H of the statute need not necessarily be considered a crime in international law. Rather, they must be of equal gravity to the crimes listed in Article 5 of the statute, whether considered in isolation or in conjunction with other acts charged. The Peace Chamber also finds that Berdanin has failed to show why no reasonable trier of facts could have reached the conclusion, beyond reasonable doubt, that Bosnian Muslims and Croats in the ARK were denied the right to proper judicial process on discriminatory grounds. Berdanin also challenges the trial chamber's finding that he was responsible for aiding and abetting and instigating the crimes against humanity of deportation and forcible transfer in light of the decisions on so-called, and I quote, voluntary resettlement, end of quote, issued by the ARK authorities. Seen in the context of the events established beyond reasonable doubt by the evidence, the appeals chamber considers that Berdanin has not shown how the trial chamber erred in finding that the decisions on voluntary resettlement and on disarmament prompted the authorities who implemented them to commit the crimes of deportation and forcible transfer. I turn now to the grounds of appeal put forward by the prosecution. The prosecution initially put forth five grounds of appeal. One of them was subsequently withdrawn and is therefore disregarded in the judgment. Of the remaining four grounds, the first two involve questions of law relating to the doctrine of joint criminal enterprise, also known as the JCE. In ground one of its appeal, the prosecution challenged the trial chamber's implicit finding that the principal perpetrators of a crime that is, the individuals who actually carry out the actus reus of the crime must be members of the JCE for any convictions via JCE to attach with regard to those crimes. In ground two of its appeal, the prosecution challenges two legal holdings of the trial chamber. First, the holding that there must be an agreement or understanding between the accused and the principal perpetrator for the accused to be convicted via JCE. And second, the JCE is applicable only to enterprises smaller than the one alleged in this case. After consideration of post-World War II jurisprudence, and the tribunal's own jurisprudence, the appeals chamber grants ground one and two of the prosecution's appeal. Briefly, as to ground one, the appeals chamber finds that a member of a JCE can be held responsible for crimes committed by non-members of the enterprise, provided that the crime can be imputed to one member of the joint criminal enterprise, and that this member, when using the non-member principal perpetrator, acted in accordance with the common plan. As to ground two, the appeal chamber finds 
that the trial chamber erred in holding that the prosecution must prove that the accused had a specific agreement with the principal perpetrator to commit a particular crime. Such a showing of a specific agreement is unnecessary in view of the common plan necessarily shared by all JCE members. Nonetheless, the prosecution must, of course, prove other elements, including the fact that, that the accused shared the common criminal purpose and that the crime in question forms part of that common criminal purpose. Also, with regard to ground two, the appeal chamber finds that the trial chamber erred in finding that the doctrine of the JCE applies only to relatively small scale cases. Prior cases provide clear authority for JCEs on scales much larger than one municipality. The appeals chamber thus grounds ground one and two of the prosecution's appeal with regard to the questions of law presented therein. A further question is how this should affect the convictions in the case at hand. In this case, the prosecution submitted that it would be unfair to enter convictions for JC against Berdanin based on the prosecution prevailing with regard to ground one of its appeal. This is because at trial, the parties shared an understanding that the principal perpetrators must belong to the JCE for Berdanin to be convicted via JCE. In light of this understanding inter partes, it would be unfair to enter new convictions against Berdanin on this basis, as he could reasonably have sought a trial that he could defeat the prosecution's case by showing that the principal perpetrators were not JCE members. Thus, he might have foregone other lines of defense on this assumption. The appeal chamber finds that, in view of this, new convictions can be entered against Berdanin in the specific and peculiar circumstances of this case only if the principal perpetrators were found to be JCE members. The appeal chamber concludes that the trial chamber did not find that all the principal perpetrators were JCE members, nor did the trial chamber specify which principal perpetrators were JCE members. Accordingly, in light of this understanding inter partes, the appeal chamber enters no new convictions under the JC doctrine. I should note that Judge Chaboudin takes a different view from the majority in regard to certain aspects of the prosecution's appeal on JCE, and he has filed a partially dissenting opinion to that effect. I myself have also filed a brief separate opinion outlining my own views with relation to a particular aspect of the prosecution's appeal. Judge Van den Vanguard has appended a declaration on this issue. In its third ground of appeal, the prosecution challenges Berdanin's acquittal for aiding and abetting willful killings in camps and detention facilities and for his acquittal in relation to certain murders committed by the Mitche paramilitary group in Teschlich municipality. The appeals chamber dismisses this ground of appeal. The prosecution's argument that Berdanin should be convicted for the killings in the camps and detention facilities relies on the trial chamber's reasoning 
in convicting Berdanin for aiding and abetting torture in the camps and detention facilities. Since the appeals chamber has, however, concluded that the trial chamber erred in finding Berdanin responsible for torture in the camps and detention facilities, the prosecution's argument here, arguments here cannot succeed. With regard to Berdanin's acquittal in relation to the murders committed by the Miche paramilitary group, the appeals chamber concludes that the prosecution failed to show that no reasonable fact finder could have reached a verdict of acquittal. In ground four of its appeal, the prosecution challenges Berdanin's acquittal with regard to the charge of aiding and abetting the crime of extermination. The appeals chamber dismisses this ground too. The appeals chamber does, uh, does agree with the prosecution that the trial chamber was unreasonable in, fail in failing to find that the principal perpetrators at the locations of four specific large-scale killings had the requisite mens rea for the crime of extermination. Nonetheless, the appeals chamber sees no adequate basis for disturbing the trial chamber's finding that Berdanning himself did not know that extermination would be committed in the ARK. Finally, the parties make no meritorious arguments with regard to sentencing that are independent of their arguments with regard to the convictions and the acquittals. Accordingly, I will not discuss issues specific to sentencing further. Since the appeals chamber has reversed certain convictions, it has reduced the sentence given to Berdanin. However, in light of the relative gravity of the crimes for which Berdanin's convictions have been overturned, and that of the crimes for which Berdanin's convictions have been upheld, as well as the relevant aggravating and mitigating circumstances, this reduction has been quite limited. I will now read the disposition of the Appeals Chamber judgment. Mr. Berdanin, will you please stand? For the foregoing reasons, the Appeals Chamber, pursuant to Article 25 of the Statute and Rules 117 and 118 of the Rules, noting the respective written submissions of the parties and the arguments they presented at the hearings of 7 and 8 December 2006 sitting in open session, allows Berdanin's appeal in part and reverses Berdanin's conviction under count three, persecution as a crime against humanity, insofar as it incorporates torture as a crime, a crime against humanity committed in camps and detention facilities, count six reverses Berdanin's conviction under count seven, tortured as a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, with respect to torture committed in camps and detention facilities only. Reverses Berdanin's conviction under count 11, wanton destruction of cities, towns, or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity as a violation of the laws or customs of war. With respect to the municipality of Bosanska Krupa only, dismisses Berdanin's remaining grounds of appeal. Allows ground one, Judge Shabuddin dissenting in part, and ground two of the prosecution's appeal but for the reasons given in the judgment, 
does not modify Berdanin's convictions in the relation thereto. Dismisses grounds three and four of the prosecution's appeal. Notes that ground far, five of the prosecution's appeal was withdrawn. Imposes a new sentence of 30 years of imprisonment, subject to credit being given under Rule 101C of the rules for the period Berdanin has spent in detention. Orders that, in accordance with Rule 103C, and 107 of the rules, Berdanin is to remain in the custody of the tribunal pending the finalization of arrangements for his transfer to the state in which his sentence will be served. Judge Christine van den Vengert appends a declaration. Judge Theodore Meron appends a separate opinion. Judge Mohammed Shabuddin appends a partially dissenting opinion. Mr. Berdanin, you may be seated. Registrar, would you please distribute copies of the judgment to the parties? Thank you. This concludes the hearing. The appeals chamber stands adjourned. All rise for your vote.